Okay, so let's begin. Um, we didn't finish 2.6 last time, so there's really no homework prompts to go over. But I was talking to my friend today. He's, he teaches here, but he also teaches at NYU. And he was, you know, so was going on about you know, how the NYU kids are strong and happy, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, I gave them a challenge problem, and no one could figure it out. So then I was thinking, what if I did my class? <laughs> what would happen? Right? So he gave them two problems. Of course, the second one was harder. But when he showed them how to do the first one, they sort of, you know, they used that to figure out the second one. Um, so here's the second problem he gave them. The first one, I believe in you guys. Okay? Hey. <laughs> I mean, like, if I give you the first one, you'll all just laugh at me and know what. You can do it for okay, so we so get extra money on this. This is the problem. Brian City College is on the line. <laughs> to actually do that limit was the problem. And those of you who saw local rule before, it's illegal here. You have to do it using methods we've done in Taiwan. Okay, so um, take a minute to think about that while I see who's here. And, um, okay, Louis. No, that's the do that limit. Um, however you can. <clears throat> Edward? Yep. Yes. And Exactly. 
This is the, this would be the equivalent of f prime of what number? Pyro six. six. Okay, so if we can figure out what the f of x is, all we have to do find the derivative and plug in pyro six, and it will be equivalent to compute this limit. Um, what do you think the function is? Okay, so 
want to find a tangent line, what do we need? Slope. How do we get to the slope? By a derivative. In what derivative? X prime, X prime, Y prime, dy dx, dx y. dy dx is what we need to find, right? dy dx is going to give us our slope. Okay, so how do we find dy dx if I'm given a function like that? Professor, how do you know dy dx will be reversed? Because remember the equation of a tangent line looks like y equals mx plus p. Right? Yeah. And the m here is change in y or change in x, which is dy over dx. Okay. So, alright, so this would be what? 2x. Right, we're trying to differentiate the y, you have to attach the dy dx to it, y. What rule? Chain. Chain. chain rule. Right? Oh, okay. 2y prime equals 0, now what? I'm going to subtract minus 2 and isolate y prime. And so this would mean that your y prime is minus 2x over. So now, how do I find the slope? Plug in x and y. Plug in x and y. It gave me the point, right? This is x coordinate, this is y coordinate. So for the x, I'm going to plug in 2. For the y coordinate, I am going to plug in 1. What? Negative 4 over 5. So what's the equation of the tangent? Line? I have a question about the equations. There was a question like this, but um, you were you only given an x value, but you were never given a y value. Right? Can you still find the slope for that? The slope for that? Uh, well, let me see if that. I mean, I did not. Yeah, but, and then I put, and I got the slope. No, plug in, like, the... Yeah, in general, what you're doing, if I only gave you the x value, what are you doing to do? Plug in the x value, oh, and then right. solve for the y value. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. So, um... I have a couple more examples, but... I was really doing them to sort of segue to related rates, but since I'm going to do related rates today, I, I don't think there's any point to it. I'll just talk about related rates. Um, but one thing I did want to show you is I showed you the proof of the power rule, right? For apply the binomial theorem to get to that answer, right? What I want to show you today, using implicit differentiation, if n is a fraction, now, any fraction, right? So I'm going from the area of integers, but now I want to prove it for fractions, right? So this is going to prove that it actually works for x and n equals a half, square root of x. We can still apply the power rule, right? Or any fractional power. Right? And how we do this is we'd actually need to do implicit differentiation. Right? So take y equals x to the n. We know that that means y equals x to the p over q. I'll give you guys a first hint. We can raise both sides to the power q to obtain this. 
If I wanted to find the derivative, how would I get to it? Huh? There is both sides. This is a fraction, right here, p q integers. Q is not zero, right? Since we've already proved for integers using binomial theorem, we know that it will work here for p and 2, because they're just integers. This means we can use implicit differentiation to be q y to the q minus 1. This will be p x to the p minus 1. Right? Now, if I want to solve y prime, what am I going to do? Hmm? All right, what does that look like? How can I sort of simplify this to get to look like what I want? Wait, what do you want? I want to prove the power rule. I want to prove that this is the answer. P over Q is already the N, yes, so I can replace this with N, right? Okay, then what? Well, these are different bases. How do I know that's n minus 1? We must apply all the bottom of our cube. I mean, all the numbers of our cube to get a common denominator. Come again? What 
What did you say? Where did the you know on the bottom slide to do Q minus one? Where did the Q minus one go? If y equals x to the theory of Uh, wait, Q minus the y we replace with. Oh, right. This is this isn't right. This y was equal to x to the p over q, and that guy is raised to we forgot the q minus one. So that's why it's sort of weird. And so this would be I probably simplify that first. This is n x to the p minus one over this is x to the what? P minus p over q, right? So this would be n x to the p minus one minus p minus p over q. This is n x to the p minus p. Those would kill each other, right? Minus a minus p over q is just positive p over q. And there's this minus 1 left, but I know p over q is actually equal to n. Right. So we can actually prove the power rule now, not just for integers, but for even fractions. So now you can be confident that when you say have x to the half, like a square root, you can actually use the power rule on it. Because we can use implicit differentiation to prove that this is true. To prove the power rule in general, like it works for any real number, like it would even work if I put pi here, for example, you would sort of need logarithms and exponentials, which you won't see until cloud two, so I guess you just have to believe me till then. Oh. Right, so with that said, So their last class especially, I was really emphasizing that y prime was dy dx, dy dx. And there was a good reason for this, because sometimes your independent variable is something other than x. For example, in the quiz, I actually got to find dx dy. That wasn't a typo. I did that on purpose. Students are very conditioned to think of x as the independent variable and y as the dependent variable all the time. when Often that is not the case, and especially in top three, that's not the case. And in particular, in related rates, it's not the case. Does everyone have one? Yes, this is actually for 2.7. So we finished 2.6, everything I wanted to do. We did enough examples. And you know, the first problem we did has been convinced that you guys understand overall. So we're just going to move on. So as you can see, related rates is a lot of word problems. So we're going to have to learn how to dissect word problems. Related rates is also an application of implicit differentiation, which is an application of the chain rule. And in related rates, the independent variable is actually time, which is usually denoted by t, which means not only does y, I can think of y as a function of t, but also I can think of x as a function of t. I, think, I can think of both quantities as changing. Or Sometimes there are several other versions, more than two. We're going to get into that soon. But um, yeah, put a little intro here about related rates, what the point is. Basically, you're relating the rates of things to find the rate of one thing knowing the rate of the other things. Right? And uh, we can actually use that to solve problems. Um, so there's a method of related rates. There's actually a sequence of steps that you sort of try to apply to every single related rates problem you've ever come across. Right? And these are the steps. Um, 
The book has a slightly different set of steps. I found in practice this one works more. So I put the steps here. The steps are what you can remember is what I put in bold, but I just put some extra explanation for it for you guys. So um, let's actually just jump right into it. Read the problem carefully. It's very important that you read it, you understand it, you can dissect the information. We're, I'm going to show you how to do that now. The second thing you're going to try to do, if possible or necessary, is draw a diagram, draw a picture, right? And we're going to see why that's important. And you're going to label the diagram properly. And how you're going to label it is the things that you know are changing, if they're increasing or decreasing, you label it with a variable. If they're staying constant, you label it with the constant that you know it is, right? And we're going to do that as well. And I want you to think of all the variables as functions of time. We're measuring rates. This is how things change with respect to time. Okay. Step three is, and this is just to keep things focused, because sometimes these problems can get really involved. You really want to know what you're looking for, what you know. So step three, I, I highly recommend that you write down the given information, write down what you know for a fact, and write down clearly what you want to get to, just to keep your focus, right? So, is there a question? Okay. Um, Fourth step, and this is probably the, the hardest step of all, step four, is you're going to come up with an equation that's going to relate all the variables you came up with before. And one reason why a diagram really helps you in that case is it can sort of suggest you what kind of equations you're using. Right? So for example, if your diagram of the situation is a triangle, you automatically know a bunch of equations you can use there, right? You use Pythagoras' theorem, law of sines, law of cosines, so at all, right? It depends on what you have and what you want to find, right? But just knowing that the picture is a triangle sort of suggests to you the direction that you want to go in. So the diagrams can be important in that case. Um, but like I said, it's if possible or necessary. Comes sometimes you don't need to, but whenever you can, it'll be helpful if you do. The fifth step is going to be differentiate the equation that you set up with respect to time, right? The independent variable is time. Then you're going to last step is to plug in what you know and, and solve for what you want to find. Sometimes you're going to have to go back and forth between the equation that you set up in step four to find more unknowns. But basically, by the time you get to step six, you would have solved the problem, right? And you answer the problem. So um, let's just illustrate this by jumping right into the exam. This is actually 2.7. Here's what we know, what do we want? Right, what do we know? 
We know how the radius is changing, right? How do I write that down? Dr, D, what? T, T. You're thinking of how it's changing with respect to time, right? It's meters per second, right? Is, what's the number? One meters. One. One. What else do I know? Meters per second. D, T, T. is equal to? Two. 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 Okay. Um, do I know any other facts at the moment? What do I want? D, B, D, T. I want the VDT when what condition is fulfilled? Right. So it says at what rate is the volume changing when R equals one and I equals three? Right? When R equals one and H equals three. Right? So write down what we know we want and then we write down what we want to find and when the, under what conditions we want to find. Right? So I know at the end of the day what am I looking for? This guy. Right? How the volume is changing. Right? That's what I want. When do I want it? Now. <laughs> okay. Right? What do you want the answer? When do I So we drew a little picture. The picture is sort of invoking to us what kind of equation we should use, especially when we know that volume is involved, so we probably think the volume equation, right? So we know we want when the volume is changing at that time, so at that point. So now what do we do? We plug in the You differentiate. No. No first we have to you have to differentiate first. No, these are right there. Step five, the next thing is to differentiate. In fact, that's a common mistake. A lot of times students plug in numbers prematurely and that messes everything up. You plug in after you differentiate, no, not before. Right? So how would I differentiate this equation with respect to time? Hmm. Right, through B is just D, 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 T. Okay? Do you do by dr? What? We write dv by dr into dr by You have the product rule that is correct. We have two functions here. Okay, so what do I do? So you just get pi r squared. Differentiate this one. What would I get? 2 pi r d. 2 pi r and d. So d r d. The R D T, right? Remember, you're thinking of R and H as functions of time, the independent variable is T, right? So you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside with respect to T. H plus, now you leave the first guy. The H is the derivative H with respect to T is the H D T. And so now I can say. When R equals 1, H equals 3, then what do I get? DBDT equals? What is it equal? Just read it off. 7 plus. 2 pi.
step five, differentiate the, that equation you came up with with respect to time. So every time you take the derivative of a variable that's not a t, you have to attach the derivative to it, right? Because the five by the chain, right? Once you do that, now you can plug in what you know and solve for what you want to find. In this case, we wanted to find t, b, t, right? Now, the problems can get more complicated. Let's do one that's slightly more complicated, problem two. The particle is moving along a curve y equals x cubed plus one, such that its y coordinate is increasing at a rate of two units per second. At what rate is the x coordinate changing when y equals nine? This is part eight. Um, I don't really think there's much point in drawing diagrams with that. So there's some particle moving along this side, right? The y coordinate is increasing at a rate of two units per second, right? Can you figure out what direction this particle will move in, given that image? It's, it's going down here, right? I don't know, I'm asking you. <laughs> right, because if it goes down, the weather will be decreasing, not increasing. Okay, good. So the particle is actually moving along this curve, going up like that, right? Okay, so that's our diagram. It doesn't really help us much here, but can we write down what we know? What do we want? What do we know? Sure, we even know the equation. They gave us the equation. Right? So don't really even have to come up with it. But what do we know? We know dy dt. This is su 2. Um, that's almost all we know. What do we want? We also know y equals 9. We want to find dx dt when y equals 9. How do I figure that out? So we're, they gave us the equation here, so we don't even have to look for it. So this would mean what? dy dt equals 3x squared dx dt plus 0. Plus 0. Okay. So, okay, so how fast is dx dt changing? Well, this is what I want, right? So I can tell this is dx dt is equal to dy dt divided by the x squared. Right. What is the x dt? Wouldn't you have a plug in the original range and just find a regular x value? Right. So this is what I mentioned in here. Sometimes when you do this step, you might end up with more unknowns than you really want. So one of your goals in that case, if that happens, what you, you would want to do in most cases is go back to the equation use that to figure out any of the missing pieces, right? So, um, so here we'll go, we'll say note, when y equals nine, this means nine should be equal to x cubed plus one. This means eight is equal to x cubed. This means x equals two. So now, I know the instant when y is 9, which is the instant I care about, the x value is 2. I know what dy dt is. I know everything except what I want to find, which is good. So dy dt, plug in 2, dx dt, d, for the x value, I also plug in 2. And that's going to be, it's going to be 1, 6 units per second. Uh, units per second.
So notice this is saying as my y value is moving up, the x value is moving to the right. right? And at that instant, it is moving at that rate. What about part B? Let's see who's really thinking now. Do you need a distance formula for this? You need a distance formula. So here's the picture. So the question asks, at this instant, how fast is the distance between the particle and the point 2, 10 changing? Is the part particle approaching 2, 10 or getting farther away from it? So here this is 1. I know when x is 2, y is 8. So 2 comma 10 would be this point here. I want to know how fast is the distance from that point changing when y equals 9, which would be some point here at the same instant, right? So the distance is just going to be the distance here, d. Can anyone tell me the equation? Well, here it gave it away. It's the distance formula, right? How would I do the distance formula? Huh? Okay, what are the x1 and y1? Differentiate that guy. Oh, things. Oh, things. 
variant is S D. This is x minus two squared plus ten squared one half. So now how do I differentiate? Derivative of this? Yeah. Take the one half. Well, you have to differentiate the whole equation, right? Was this size equal? This is d d d t equals. Now you're gonna have to do this. You have to apply the chain rule. Yep. 
What do you mean you haven't? You learned them at some point. Yeah. Yes, that's why I mentioned here. Remember your geometry. So you're going to see things like cylinders and cones a lot, triangles, trigonometry, geometry. You have to remember all those forms. They're typically they're they're formulas that you used all the time back when you were in high school, so you remember it. If, if, if a formula is ever too weird or tricky, they give it to you. But in general, they'll expect you to remember the stuff. Like the distance formula, they'll expect you to remember it. They're not going to tell you that. Um, is the particle approaching to comma 10 or getting farther away from it? What's your reason? What does negative mean? So if I say d d t is negative, what does that mean? If I look at d as a function, what does it mean when the derivative is negative? It's decreasing. Right? And we're going to talk more about this later, but this means decreasing. So if your d is decreasing, the distance between the two points is decreasing, what does that mean? You're getting closer to the point. Third problem 
very typical problem again. The ladder leaning against the vertical wall. Right. So for part A, we have a 15 foot ladder resting against the vertical wall, suddenly and without warning. Right? The foot begins to slide away from the wall at 2 feet per second. At what rate is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the foot of the ladder is 9 feet from the wall? So you write the problem carefully. Can you come with a picture to describe the situation? This is the vertical wall, that's the ground. Here's the ladder leaning against the wall. Right? Okay, so we've drawn our diagram. How do we label it? Label the horizontal by the the vertical y just for the horizontal x and the vertical y just for sentimental reasons. What do I label the hypotenuse? 15. 15, right? So remember, we label things that are changing by variables. Anything that's constant, label it by a constant, right? Don't put a Z here or some other variable because it's actually not changing. The length of the ladder is not changing. It's what length it is. Right? Um, and putting extra variables in there is going to confuse you and make the problem a lot harder, right? So the length of the ladder isn't changing. Label it by the constant that you know it is, right? However, we know that the distance, the foot of the Right? This is actually moving. My x is getting bigger. So that's a variable, so I can call that x. As this is sliding down that way, this will be sliding down. So this distance is also changing. So that I label a variable as well. So anything that I see is changing, put a variable. Anything that I know is just staying one thing, put a constant. So what do we know? What do we want? We know the XDT. We know the XDT. What is it? Two. It's sliding away, right? X is getting bigger as I'm sliding away, which means I know it's a positive rate. Right? If I, I could have changed this question and said someone's pushing the foot of the ladder towards it, and then you would have put a negative here. Right? It's very, that's why I read the problem carefully. Right? It's very important. Okay. What else do we know? We know X. That's do we know x? Well, we need to want well, no x. Yeah. Well, that's not the only rate we know. What do we want? We want, we want dy dt. dy dt. We want to find at what rate is this moving down? Two feet per when second. When x equals nine. When x equals nine. Right? So this ladder is sliding away. At some instant, it's going to be nine feet away from the wall. At that point, I want to know how fast is this guy sliding down. Right. Okay, what's the equation? X squared plus y squared equals 225. Right, so the diagram, again, was our suggestion here, right? You can imagine that this is a right triangle, and here we have only side lengths to worry about. Pythagoras is theory. Right. I know that x squared plus y squared equals 15 squared. Okay? So I read the problem carefully, came with the diagram, write down what I know, what I want, and use that to come with an equation. What's the next step? We should probably, we should probably solve for y first since we may need it. So you're looking too far ahead, but okay, we can do that. <laughs> we know what x is. We're like, eh, if I differentiate this, the y is going to stick around because it's a y squared. So I should probably save myself the trouble and find the y now. Right? When x equals 9, this means that 9 squared plus y squared equals 15. What is y? 12. Yeah, 12. How do you know it's 12? So 3, 4, 5 triangle. That's the answer I was looking for. Right? Other things that they expect you to remember from algebra are things like the 3, 4, 5 triangle. And the, um, what's another one? 7, 12, 13. That one. 7, 12, 13. 7, 12, 13. Yeah. I mean, you take this square and then you add the square of those two. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. 
Five, twelve, thirteen. I'm sorry. Five, twelve, thirteen. Okay, right. So it means that if you don't have a right triangle and you know one side is four, the hypotenuse is five, you automatically know the other side is three, right? These are things, right? And this actually works in proportion. So if this side is fifteen, which is five times three, you know the other side is nine, which is three times three, then the other side must be four times three, which is twelve. Right, so you can save yourself a lot of work by just not seeing these patterns. They're going to throw them at you all the time, right? just like I did. Yes? Why don't you take the derivatives x square plus y square equal to g square? The next I could, um, but they, they saw that I would need to know what the y value is later on, so they wanted to do it now. But yeah, strictly following these steps, I would have done the derivatives. But they decided to take a pit stop. So this means that y is 12. All right, we're going, we're going to use this later. We'll see what it shows up. Right? So if you have this equation, the next thing you want to do is differentiate. Right? And differentiate things will give us what? The x dt. Remember, t is the independent variable in related rates. So even when you differentiate the x, you have to attach this to the root. I could even divide both sides by 2 to get rid of those, right? So here we know that the x is 9, so here you see that we're going to need to know the y, right? Maudi, this is, this is why they solve for it here, because they're going to eventually need to know it. Here, x I know is 9, dx dt is 2, plus y is 12, that's why we need to solve for it dy dt, I don't know. That's what I want to find. So now I can just solve for dy dt. This implies dy dt is going to be equal to 2 nines 18, and I bring it over. That's minus 18 divided by 12. What? And it could be uh, feet per second. Feet per second. So that's how fast this thing is decreasing at that instant. Are we sort of getting the hang of this? Yes. Okay, more examples. Because there, like I said, there are a lot of situations because there are a lot of shapes that they expect you to remember equations about, right? So there are tons of different scenarios that can happen here. So I mean, let's do chart B, yes. Now we're in chart B. It says, at what rate is the angle between the top of the ladder and the wall changing at the same instant? Is the angle increasing or decreasing? This is our diagram. We know this is x, this is y, we know this is 15, but now we have a third variable in play. Where is that third? Between the wall and the Here, right? The problem mentioned the angle between the ladder and the wall. Right. So now there is a theta. At this point, what do we know? What do we want? I know dy dt. I also know dx dt. dy dt was what? Minus 0, 2. X, dx dt was 2. two. Alright, what do I actually want in this? We want that. We want to know how the angle is changing when? At the same instant. So, how can we describe that instant? When x equals 9 and y equals 12, right? So, here's a, the, sort of the same situation, but now we want to, we're after something else. We're after the rate of change of the angle. How do I, what's my equation? So, that's all. Remember, so that's all. 
good. Hi everyone. What is the sign for? Okay, so compare with respect to theta, who is the opposite side? X. The adjacent side is? Right. Um, notice that I could have easily also used like a cosine over sine, right? I could also do that. Opposite over hypotenuse, that's the sine. And that will only make me care about one variable. Right, there are a bunch of equations I can choose from here. I can say tangent theta is equal to x over y, or I can say sine theta equals x over d, or I can say cosine theta equals y over 15. And you'd all get you get to the same answer in all these cases eventually. Um, which case would you choose? Because it's like right there, that's why you choose science. Because I'm given to this. Okay. If it's given, then you, if you made a mistake in the part A, then you don't have to worry about it. We're getting into the sign of cosine. Personally, I would have chosen the cosine. No, the, the sine, because the derivative is like the whole number. Right, the derivative of the other one was a fraction. No, I think Right, you know, you take it easy, but sometimes, right? Not just hard enough. Okay, so if I do that, so if I say sine of theta is equal to x over 15, what do I do now? Now you find the derivative. Find the derivative, how do I find the derivative of that equation? Uh, sine theta is cosine theta. Cosine theta. Equals? Huh? What in the bottom? 15. Fifteen. Square. Square. What? No. One fifteen times dx dt. One fifteen times dx dt. Right. So now what? Yeah, yeah, we can set it up. I got to change the song. How do you set it up? 